I will get started by introducing our incredible guest today. First, we have Stephanie Coughlin. Stephanie founded Image Intelligence, a division of Responsible Media in 2018. For several decades, Stephanie has partnered with such successful fashion, design, and well-being brands, including Architectural Digest, GQ, Self Magazine, and Vogue. As a result of working with such blue chip brands, her experience has yielded many successful partnerships, such as Big Sisters of Boston, Emerald Necklace, Conservancy, The Julie Fund, as well as GlamSquad.com and many others. That is Miss Stephanie, and we also have Miss Amy Schechter here with us today as well. Amy brings a distinguished record of enterprise leadership and business success in the fashion and fitness industry to her CEO role at Glam Squad, a technology-powered, consumer-focused company providing on-brand, at-home beauty services. A bold visionary, nimble strategist, and inspiring organizational leader, Amy has built businesses from the ground up, revitalizing brands for greater relevance and accelerated growth and profitability for established companies. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Ms. Amy Schechter and Ms. Stephanie Coughlin and pass it over to our co-founders, Jacqueline and Summer. Wow, we are so thrilled to be here today with two complete powerhouses and personal friends. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we are Feely. Feely stands for tribe. So for us, that's really family and community. We are a female founders mastermind private network. We focus on education, training, accountability, resource sharing, and funding opportunities for early stage female founders. So thank you for being here. We have so many questions. We are excited to ask Amy and Stephanie. And I also want to start by saying, let this be conversational and exploratory. If you have a question, please don't wait till the end of the session. Drop it in the chat box, virtually raise your hand. We want to hear from you. We want you to feel engaged and open to have this conversation with us. So I'm going to kick this off by asking Amy and Stephanie, tell us a little bit about your career path and your personal journeys and also how are they different? So Amy, maybe you can kick us off here. Okay, happy to do that. Hi, everybody. It's so amazing to meet all of you today. Um, I'm honored to be here. I am currently the CEO of a company called Everbody. It's a really, really small but mighty business. For those of you in the startup world, you know what that's all about. Uh, we just closed a round of $38 million. So super psyched to talk to you about how to effectively fundraise as a woman, which by the way, isn't easy. I spent my career in the fashion industry for a number of years and then rolled into wellness and beauty. And um, in that stint, I have been a four-time president or CEO. So very accustomed to fundraising, pitching, and receiving a lot of no's. Just in case any of you out there get no's, it is really common and don't be bummed out about it. I've probably gotten more no's than anybody on this call. So really excited to share my vision with you today around leadership, around fundraising, around networking and collaboration and answer any questions that you have because this is, this is about leaving you with inspiration and actually some real tactical learnings that will allow you to go back after this call and be better at what you're doing. Wow. What a powerhouse, Amy. <laughs> so many questions that I can't wait to dive into, but seriously, you are doing it. You have done it for years. You're passing the roadmap and we are so excited to be learning from you today. Thank you. And Stephanie, we'd love to hear about your career trajectory, your path, and kind of what you're focused on now and into the future. So how exciting it is that she's been my client for 40 years. I just want to start off by saying that, that we are in the same room in case anyone wonders. Hello. <laughs> um, so I currently run a company called Image Intelligence that I founded in 2018 after spending 15 years at Vogue, recognizing that Many people are so afraid uh, about their own look and how they put themselves together to be successful. So I launched the company to really help people um, put their personal brand together. But back in the day, I started as a media planner at J. Walter Thompson, my first job, and got fired. Just in case ever, anyone ever worries about whether they've chosen the right career path, because we're all working towards what we can be, you know, what our passions are. 
From there, I went to the media business and worked at Self Magazine and Glamour, where I met Amy and have known her since we were in our 20s and worked together with her in many different ventures. And then I went and launched a company called Responsible Media, which represented brands like Vogue and DQ and uh, Architectural Digest. And our role was sales and marketing in the states of New England. And we had to go out there and sell print, digital, all kinds of different media properties. And um, then I launched um, into Image Intelligence after that. But one thing I wanted to add a little bit about my background was that I'm also a very big philanthropist. And in when I first met Amy, we launched something called the Stifle Paralysis Research Foundation, which today is the Chris and Dana Reeve Foundation. And we're going to morph fundraising into this conversation because what Amy and I have in common is that we have both fundraised constantly in our lives, okay? What we have that's slightly different is that I came from the sales and marketing side and Amy was always on the buy side. But as we've grown up together, we've both been doing fundraising and selling and marketing and overlapping our contacts and our relationships constantly and supporting each other. So what I would say to you um, is that you will learn a great deal about being an entrepreneur today and what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And it isn't easy. It takes incredible courage. So again, stop us anytime. We're going to share personal stories and we hope and are really excited to be here together. Oh, thank you so much, Stephanie. Yeah. So ladies, who, for whoever you haven't met Stephanie yet, I want to give a little bit of background and context. So Stephanie has been leading of our mastermind ladies for high level workshops, specifically for personal image consulting. And every time we have done a workshop with Stephanie, our ladies tend to have so much knowledge. And when they walked away, they often feel like armed with confidence. It's such a powerful content that's more than like superficial, what are you going to put on, what are you going to wear? So the knowledge you pass to our ladies actually is like inner confidence. So I really want to say how grateful we are and uh, Amy it's so funny because when I'm not sure when you left the glam squad because I personally I used the glam squad in the past and also I personally used everybody <laughs> you, okay I love yeah. it that's great you have all um, of the best startups <laughs> yes absolutely no yeah. Yeah, to further our conversation a little bit, let's talk about um, resilience. So please share a personal story about resilience. Share any highs and lows you experienced while building your business. So let's start with Amy. The first thing I want to say is we all have had highs and lows. Like, let's just face it. We've, we've all been fired. Well, if you haven't already, you probably will be. It's cool. Like, don't worry about it. We, and, and I, I say that, you know, lightly because it happens. We, we have all been in circumstances where we've worked for people that we didn't like. We have been in circumstances where we don't feel an affinity for what we're working on. And what I would say is more than anything else, I, I truly believe that all of these experiences make you more proficient as a leader. If you don't have an experience that impacts you in a way that sets you back a little to reset, I truly believe that it's difficult to be a leader with empathy. Today, I lead a very large community. I have led big businesses, small businesses. And the one thing that I bring with me is compassion and kindness. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Our role as leaders is to inspire and to curate and cultivate an environment of kindness. And so much of that is controlled by who you work for and who you work with. And if you cannot be true to your brand, then adios and say goodbye. Because at the end of the day, personal satisfaction is what wins every single time for you in your own personal brand. And if you're not having satisfaction in what you're doing, then start to think about where you want to go and what you want to do and make something else happen for yourself. 
Can I just say bravo? And and I just want to jump in and say one quick thing, because what you just mentioned is so beautiful. Your focus on compassion and kindness, while also building your business and being a successful leader. And oftentimes, I think those two pillars are overlooked or undervalued. So I just really want to say how much we appreciate you mentioning that those are part of your core values that you bring to your business and consistently show up with such a powerhouse, Amy. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I I will say that I have learned this to a greater extent throughout my years as a leader. And very often when you're working for someone that doesn't share your personal values, you have to own the values that they own. And you either rub up against them the wrong way, or you have to leave because it doesn't align with who you are as a person. The beautiful thing about being a CEO, and many of you are founders or senior level executives in your field, is you get to set the tone for your team and your business. And the most successful companies, and I will say bar none of size, are successful because people feel inspired, they feel heard, and they feel as though they can contribute more than just showing up every day and doing their job. And I'll jump in and say, I think that's part of the reason why when you are starting a business, you need to find that network of people to support you that have common values. So they understand what you're about they appreciate what you're about and they can help you and give you advice and vice versa. You can do the same for them. So Amy and I, I found that out about her way a long time ago, 25 <laughs> plus years that she had compassion and kindness, but she's 15 years ago, 15, 15 years, years plus, ago, however long ago it was, but that's what we had. I found out in her that we had these common values and that is why we've done business in about seven places together through our years. So I'll just share a quick anecdote about my story of resilience. And I think, as Amy said, we have many of them, but I'll start talking just for a second about founding responsible media. I left Condé Nast and said, I don't want to do this in a big corporate setting any longer. I would like to be an entrepreneur and I want to go out there and and run my own business for the exact same reasons, because the people I worked with there, I did not value what they valued and they did not treat us with respect or kindness. Everybody knows what Condé Nast is all about, the same today. So in launching Responsible Media, we had several big brands from Vogue to GQ to Architectural Digest. And what our job was to sell advertising programs digitally through print and marketing programs across several states. We had, we only made money when we sold something. We did not have a base salary. We had one employee who only got paid when we sold something. We had no LinkedIn, we had no followers, we had no likes. The only way to connect was through the phone or through a fax machine or sending something to someone that interested them. So truly, we were on our own and we did not have a lot of support. So how do we do it? We contacted every single person we knew in the world. Seriously, every contact, every colleague, every friend, our family members, because we had no money and we borrowed money. We didn't take a salary. We had no health insurance. I was not a parent at that point, but still it was very scary, I would say. And we also, I think the number one thing we did well was every time we met somebody new, we asked three questions of that person. Tell us about yourself, your business. How can we help you? What can we do to make your life easier? Instead of walking in the room and saying, I would really like to sell you Vogue and I'd like $2 million. It was, how can we help you? What can we do for you? And what would make a difference in your life? And in a year and a half, we actually made our first big sale and we were able to hire people. But you have to really think about how do you become indispensable to somebody else? How do you become reliable and memorable? And it's by understanding their business and really taking charge of understanding how to help them instead of figure, take yourself out of the equation. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because I know there are a lot of people on the line that 
that have to go out there and fundraise. And let's let's just all uh, this cone of silence. Fundraising as a woman sucks. Like let's just say it as it is. Two percent of the funding in the world. I think maybe in 2021 it's going to go up to three percent. If anyone's cheering out there, woohoo! Three percent of the actual dollars available are going to go to women. Finally, we went from two to three. But it, it's really tough. And what Stephanie's talking about in terms of using your relationships and making yourself indispensable and curating a reason why they should invest in you, that, that's like table stakes of walking into the room. Have you done your research on every single person you're going to be speaking to? Have you determined how your business is going to amplify their portfolio? At the end of the day, you are not really convincing them about your business. You are showing them how you're going to make their portfolio richer. And it doesn't necessarily have to be richer in funds, but it definitely has to be richer. So brand appropriateness, are they looking for this particular space? Do they know about this space? Do they know about the opportunity? You have to create a selling communication, a marketing story that communicates effectively and easily why they need you. And you can't forget that from the moment you shake their hand, which by the way, if any woman out there has a weak handshake, unacceptable. A handshake is the first tool that you communicate when you walk into a room. And a lot of meetings today are being done on Zoom. But if you meet people externally or in a pitch, if you go in with the princess handshake, I don't want to talk to you. If you go in with a dead fish, it's not interesting. Like you got to go in there with muscle and confidence and you lock hands with that person. Did you know that the most important part of a handshake is eye contact? It's eye contact. It's hard to believe you go in there and you touch hand to hand and you look them in the eye and you tell them who you are. And that's a memorable experience. It starts the meeting on the right foot. Thank you so much, Amy and Stephanie, for answering those questions so open and honestly. And that kind of leads me into my next question. How have we helped each other accelerate careers and relationships? This is what it's all about. And Stephanie, you are the queen of relationships, of nurturing them, of building them and friendships and being there to support everybody that you love and consistently show up for them in life personally and professionally. So I'd love to know how you both have been able to support each other. And what does that look like for your larger community to show up and help and truly help? Look, I've learned from Amy my whole life. I learned from the day I met her that creativity and resourcefulness were really, really important. But I think through the years, we have guarded each other. We've been each other's angels. I'm in her village and she's in mine. But it happened because I understood what she needed in the beginning. I understood that I needed to be resourceful. I understood that I needed to help her build her brand. And when I went out to raise money, and I'll give you an example, when I went out to raise money and needed su a support for an initiative, which we were just talking about earlier, I went, so I, I helped found the Stifle Paralysis Research Foundation, which is not a business endeavor. It is a fundraiser to, it was, it was a fundraiser to try to raise money for spinal cord paralysis due to a family tragedy. So I took every business contact I ever had. I went to Amy and I said, Amy, she worked at the time at Lady Foot Locker, a brand that not a lot of people knew it was a stepchild to Foot Locker. And I said, I need you to go to every single vendor and help me raise money. I need to raise $400,000 in this time, in this time frame. And she did exactly what, what I hoped for. So the lesson really uh, in sort of in resilience is that you need to really surround yourself with people who really help you and who support you in all areas of your life. We've been through many, many dark times in our life. When I founded the Chris and Dana, when, I, when we convinced Chris Reed to come on board, it was a very big deal. And we had learned so much about making sure that we knew as much about him as we could possibly know before we asked him to join our organization. So I would just say that she has helped me through my life in every element of fundraising. She's helping me in my personal life. 
she's helped me because I understood she would always be in my village. And the same is true for me. Like, it, you know, obviously I've learned tremendously from, from Steph and we push each other and we're honest with each other. And I think you need that in your village. You need female mentors and they don't have to be female, but I think there's something about female mentors that just creates a vulnerability and an honesty that becomes very real. And, no, you know, no dissing men here. I, I love men. And I have mentors that are men, uh, but there's something about the connection between women that is just so authentic to, to how I personally feel. And maybe I should make this about me as opposed to anybody else. It's really worked for me. The one thing that I would say is, you know, people have said to me, how do you create your village? I mean, it's a really interesting question. If you're just starting out, Katie's just starting out, like, who is her village? What is her village? How does she think about her village? The village is not necessarily, you know, your boss from an old company. Sometimes those are the, you know, not people that you want to put in your village. Sometimes those people are peers. Some of my greatest village people are, are people that I worked alongside and I trust implicitly. And, and sometimes they're people I met through business that I don't really know. And sometimes they're people that I don't know. And I do want to give this, again, it's a golden nugget. Take it for what it's worth. I, I use LinkedIn. And I know I can see some people on here that I know use LinkedIn as well. LinkedIn is a resource for people to capitalize on if you know how to use it effectively. It can be the black hole. It can also be a community builder. And, you know, I have had people from 18 to 50 say to me, how do I connect with people? The first thing that I would say to you is don't be afraid because if you don't ask, you will never, ever find out. So number one rule, don't be afraid to build your village. Number two, if you don't have people you like in your village, Toss them and get people that you like in your village, that you like and you trust, because your community around you is the community that's going to buoy you through the, the really difficult decisions. And you have to have people around you that are going to be honest. Number three, if you reach out to people and they don't respond, and I will bring this up again, it's the same thing with fundraising. If you knock on the door and they say no, who cares? They're lost. Do not take it personally. Knock again on someone else's door and I guarantee they will open a door. Not every time, not everyone, but people reach out to me all the time on LinkedIn. And I will tell you, I'm a responder. If it's a sales call, not so much. But if people reach out to me, someone did last week, they reached out to me and said, I'm interested in this. Can you help me? I said, look, I don't know if I can help you. Send me your resume. I'll give you 15 minutes. I mean, I don't know this person from Adam. She wrote to me and she, it was a kick, can I say this? Kick-ass um, email. It was a kick-ass email on LinkedIn. And I was like, she's, she's got moxie. I want to know more about her. I want to, I want to see if I can help her. And so know that, that there are places you can go to help you build your community and don't be afraid to do it. I love that. I love that. So everybody have moxie. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask, yeah. right? Don't Reach be afraid. out and ask. I think the point of, of what Amy's also saying is that when you found these people that share your values in your village, you can go back to them time and time again. We've done business together in seven places. And because we have those shared values, and we've always, she's always empowered me to bring her in, in initiatives that might matter to her or matter to me. But I went to her and said, I need you to help me raise money. It wasn't even a business venture. But that's because we had overlapping friends, colleagues, and contacts that we could go to. And I tell her today, she needs help. She has a friend who needs help getting into an investment bank. Ask me. I have plenty of contacts. I don't know her friend, but I'll do it for her because she's in my village. So don't be afraid, follow up right away and, you know, figure out what you want to learn about that person that you want to meet that you've never met, figure out what's special about them and use that in your email. 
So they go, oh my goodness, this person knows something about me and they care about me. I want to take their call. I want to take, I'm going to respond to their email so that you are remembered differently and you're Definitely. memorable. Definitely. Being memorable is super important. Very important. Um, being charismatic. But I think that comes from also not being afraid. Right. Because if you are your authentic self and you're not afraid, then people get to experience who you really are. And when people experience who you really are, they believe you. Absolutely. And building trust is a critical element of success because you really can't win people over if you're guarded by your own veil and your own wall. We're gonna go out there and we're gonna beat our chests and we're gonna say, I am here. Even if you do it like before you walk into the meeting, I wouldn't suggest doing it in the meeting, but <laughs> doing it before you walk in the room, I am here, I have arrived, I am going to sell you ice to the Eskimos, whatever it is, and you've got this. And I think ensuring that you have those conversations with people that are, are in your camp and on your side before, before you do it. I'm going to share like a little teeny secret with you. I know that one of my executives is on this call and she hasn't started working for us and she doesn't know this, but we very often like breathe together as a team before we go out and fundraise. Sounds crazy, right? Like talk about the crazy stories I could share with you. But we were trying to, at Glam Squad, trying to pitch a really, really big deal. And we sat in the lobby of this Fortune 500 company, and this is only a visual that you, you can imagine, with literally 20, 30 people around us. And we did a breathing session, and we all, we all did deep breathing together to align our energy, to align our vision, and it was one of the best meetings we ever had. And we, we won the partnership and we got funded. And so I'm not saying that's going to work for you to breathe as a team, but do what works for you and don't be afraid. My team said to me, we were in this in crazy busy office and they're like, we're going to do this right here. I asked if there was a private room and there wasn't. So I'm like, we're doing it. Everybody like knee to knee, get in a circle, let's deep breathe. And I swear to you, they thought we were completely insane, but we did it. And we were so aligned as a team and we went in there and kicked but I love that. We're all going to be doing breast circles now before every cluster. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yeah. I'm doing it in the, in the cat, in the cat here. I know. Stay fearless. Everybody yes. in the room right now is fearless. I love my fearless ladies. Amazing. Right. Yeah. And before we ask our questions, I saw another question coming from Maureen. I will just ask this question for you. So Maureen's question is, what is the optimal size of your village? Oh, that yeah. is such a good question. I don't think there's an optimal size in my opinion. I think you have to create a community around those people that have the same values as you, that you can learn something from and that you can teach something to. You can advise them, they can advise you. They can help you, you can help them. To me, that's a relationship. And that's a person I want in my village. And I think you can expand your village. Like I think our villages are probably a little bit larger than some of your villages because we've been doing it just a slightly <laughs> little bit longer. Just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. So, but I will, I will say to you that this never ends, that when you have that contact, you must nurture, I mean, must. My lesson is that if you don't keep in touch with that person and you don't nurture that relationship continuously, it can go away. And we've been in this situation for the last 18 months. And I think we're all preparing for how we come back out and trying to connect with people. And so I think it's very important that it's just a consistent behavior, I guess. Yeah. Something that you're doing in your life all the time. We, Amy and I have gone through periods where we haven't been as in touch, but we'll, she will always be there for me. And she's been through many dark periods of my life, seriously, and has picked me up. And it could be three years went by. We just, life got really busy and we had kids and husbands and all of that. We never, ever have lost touch. And everything I've done, when she launched Glam Squad in Boston, she called me. She goes, are you going to help me? And I was like, you're giving me no notice. Am I going to help you today? <laughs> okay. Yes, you're going to help me yes. today. So I know her MO and I know if she calls me that it's real. 
So I think that's what's really important. Your village can't be defined by its size. It's got to be defined by the quality of people in it. Yeah, and I would say like your village is, it can be your significant other and partner. I mean, I, I learned so much from my daughter. I mean, I, I feel like I go back to school sometimes or, you know, have to learn something all over again from her. I learn from my husband. I learn from the people I work with. Steph is sitting across. Uh, there are things that I learn from her every day. I am a perpetual student, so I try to approach life through that lens, which helps. But I have people yesterday, I had someone reach out to me that I haven't spoken to in eight years, I think. And she said, I am interviewing for a job that I'm passionate about. And they have asked for this kind of perspective on me. And would you do it for me? And I said, no problem. I did it, you know, I, I had to answer a questionnaire and commit to a 15 minute conversation. No problem. And, and so what I would say is, you know, go back to those people, yeah. scratch off the dust that's accumulated on some of those relationships with people that you liked and bring them back into your village when you need them. If you had a good relationship with them years ago, don't be afraid to reach out. I was nominated for, I, I won an award a couple of years ago and it was at like a big fancy hotel and it was five women in New York and they went and they actually brought a film crew to five people that were three people that I knew along my life that they could put up on the big screen during the session and they could talk about me. I went back to my first job and this is like almost a hundred years ago <laughs> and said to my mentor at the time, would you be willing to tell the story of me Amy, when I was really, really wet behind the ears and didn't know what I was doing at all. And he was like, sure. I hadn't spoken to him in a very long time. And he went and he did that for me. And, and so what I would say is like, don't be afraid to, you know, remove the dust and go and speak to people that you respected and you know you had a decent relationship with and utilize that contact because as you need people going forward, it's a really, really good resource to bounce ideas off of. So good. Thank you so much, Amy. And I like that you also mentioned the family part, like your daughter and your husband. And we will go back to that later. And I saw a question coming from Anissa. And Anissa, do you want to ask this question? I think this question is specifically for Stephanie. Yes, well, it's for both. I just put on ask as an example. I, I think this whole idea of personal brand is something that I've worked in big corporates most of my career. And even the startup that I founded a couple of years ago was with sort of corporate backing. So I'm transitioning to my own startups. It's 100% me. And I know my personal brand is going to be something that I have to do and have to be comfortable with and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just curious for you, for both of you, what, what was that process like of taking sort of the, your brand within maybe a niche of one industry and then leaving a corporate and opening up your personal brand really to what you were doing, but without, you know, I feel like my personal professional brand is really specific to one industry. So just curious what your, <laughs> like my personal brand in the professional sense, like people know one aspect of me really. Yeah. So what I would say is, first of all, your, your personal brand comes before you do. I am mentoring a friend of my daughter's who is trying to get a summer internship. And I said to him, your resume is your story. Your resume right now reads very tactical. And the first thing somebody's going to get about you is your resume. And it has to be a story that creates an emotional connection to you. The next thing is your LinkedIn page. The next thing is your Facebook or your Instagram, or depending upon your age, your TikTok. And so each of these elements tell your story. And brand building is something that personal brand building around who you are as an individual isn't defined just by the jobs that you've had. It's defined by how you, put, how you portray the story that you want to tell people every day in the places where they have access to it. I can tell you as an individual owner, the first thing people are going to do when you are investing is they go to your LinkedIn page 
to see the story that you're telling about yourself. They will go to your social media handles for sure. I will guarantee that. And they're going to look on LinkedIn to see if they know anybody personally that you are linked in with. It's guaranteed. And so all of these things are going to start to bring your story to life. And so you want to tell your story the way you want to tell it. And it doesn't matter if you had X job. What's the story about that job that somebody should know about that has impacted you as a leader? And then certainly the other side of this is how you look, how you act, how you shake hands, which is, I'm going to toss that over to my partner over here who can take it to the next level. You know, like it or not, people judge you right away. They're not listening to what you say. When you meet somebody for the first time, they are not listening to what you say. They're looking right at you and they're making character assessments so quickly. So I would say to you that along with everything Amy said, which is all part of the story, when you show up, you want to show up like yourself. So you need to look like yourself. And what does that mean? We all send these nonverbal messages that say something, whether you're wearing straight lines, which are more authoritative, let's say you're wearing you know, a print like I'm wearing today. It's more friendly, it's more approachable. So you have to think about how do I wanna come across and in what situation? Because color, shape, texture, as Amy said earlier, your handshake, looking somebody in the eye, not having your phone out when you're meeting somebody for the first time, put it away. You're grooming. All of it makes a difference because first impressions are formed in less than a tenth of a second and they last up to six months. And if you if you're making God, we all make bad first impressions. Man, I'm sure I've done it a hundred times. But it takes at least six exposures to that person after that first faux pas to actually change that impression. So your personal branding is very important because you want to feel like yourself. When you go out there on LinkedIn or, or not LinkedIn on Zoom, or you walk into a room of people you don't know, you want to feel great about yourself and you have to spend a little time investing in what does that mean? What color looks good on me, et cetera. Yes, so true. Amy, we really want to ask you this question because as you said, women, when it comes to fundraising, were so overprepared and underfunded at the same time. And um, I know half of the room here were in the process of close over seed round or series A. Since you've been raising throughout your entire career, our question for you is how much capital have you raised in your career to date? And what was your biggest learning lesson with investors and VC funds? Mm. Ooh, I don't, it's hundreds of millions, I guess, is how much I've raised in total. I've never actually calculated it. Uh, it's a really good question, but you know, yeah, a, a lot. And I'm um, in all different kinds of companies and, and situations. The first advice or the first point I would make is it's really hard. I mean, it's definitely harder for a woman for sure, but it's really hard in general. It is a frothy market right now. It is a good market to try to pitch in. When I think about what is critical for a successful pitch, which I think is what you are asking, what advice would I give to somebody that's going out to pitch in the next year? It starts with your story of your brand. We recently closed here and we made the decision when we were putting our deck together, we didn't have a lot of money and we made the decision that we were going to do it ourselves. And we looked at the deck and we looked at each other and we were like, oh goodness, this is not a good first impression. None of us were like, you know, the, uh, I guess the, the highest caliber creatives, our team was super busy and they couldn't dedicate like, you know, a week to making a beautiful deck. And we started to investigate ways that we could make a beautiful, beautiful deck. And it seems like a really silly thing, but every single picture that you put in that deck matters. Every word that you put on the page matters. And just when you think your deck is great, you show it to someone you respect and they tear it apart and be open to it. We had, oh, I don't even want to tell you how many iterations we had. It was in the 20s. We had so many iterations of our Series B deck because we asked and then we listened. And we ended up going to somebody 
to help us make it beautiful. And I'm so happy that we did because the impression that we made about who we were and how we showed up was much bigger than the brand that we were. And it helped people believe us. And you know, Steph talks about like how you look and how you show up personally. I think that's really true about your deck. Mm -hmm. I think how your deck shows up says something about who you are as a person, how you think about what you're pitching and the care in which you've put into the creation of your deck. So it starts with your deck. It then gets into the story. Have you crafted a really focused story that's easy to understand? Have you focused on your priorities? If you go out there, and I, I hate to say this, it's a generalization, and I, I will apologize in advance. As women, we say too much. You know, we promise too much, we say too much, we amplify our own stories. Super, super focused. What are the three things you wanna tell this investor? And why should they believe you? And what's the benefit to you? The next thing I would say is, who are you going out to speak to? Have you done your research on them? Do you know anybody that knows them? Can you get a, an introduction through a friend of a friend of a friend? If not, and you're going in cold, what do you know about the people that will be in the room? We always do our diligence on the people in the room. So we know if they have a dog, because you look on Instagram, you know if they like the outdoors, because you look on Instagram. So, you know, use your resources to become an educated person. So they not, they not only they have done their research on you, you've done their research on them. And then the one final thing that I would say is all investors really care about is the added benefit that you're going to bring. You have to make it simple. It has to be very clear and it has to be attainable. So it's not going to take five years to make this happen. In the next year, we're going to do this. This is how we're going to do it. And this is how it benefits you. So you show your accountability, your focus, and your vision. So I would just add a little bit to that because that was incredible. And I would try to change your mindset slightly when you are going to meet somebody for the first time and think about, again, as she just said it, how can you help them? Rather than what can you get? What can I ask for? She just noted, go figure everything else you can about them. Figure out what makes them special and then play to that special characteristic. They will never forget you. Um, I think that is really, really important. We're all often, too often coming in and we're just talking about ourselves. Stop talking about yourself and talk about what you can do for that investor. And they will always, they'll think of you as, you know, one in 500 they talk to. And, you know, they may pass, even if you do all of this right, you will get, I'm sure all of you know this, you get, a gazillion, and that is a, an analytical and statistical word, you get a gazillion no's. And you, you can't be deflated from it. It's a no. Like, don't take it personally. Evaluate and assess, was there anything I could have done better? Were they jerks and they passed and they didn't get it? Probably yes. So don't kill yourself over a no. Pull yourself up and evaluate how can I do it better the next time? Um, was I in the wrong place? And go out there and do it again, again, and again. And don't be discouraged because women are getting two to 3% of the investments. And there are a lot more female funds out there. And the female funds are funding female businesses. So if you don't know those female funds, make yourself a student of those funds that are run by women. Because it's just like, when you're applying to an all-girls school, you get a better chance of getting in because your audience wants at least your gender. So go out there and find the women investing in women's businesses. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Amy and Stephanie. And our last question for you, I'm gonna kind of bundle two together. So okay. here, here it goes. When you're constantly being told no, and it's hard, and you're tired, and you're a mother, and you're a wife or partner, and you're running your business, how do you pull yourself up 
to be a conscious leader on the days when you just don't feel like showing up? What do you personally do? What tools and resources do you have for other founders to show up as a leader on the days when it's really hard? And paired with that, the notion of balance, is there even such a thing? How do you do it all? How do you do it? That's such a great question. I think for me, personally, and this may not work for everybody, I have to go back to the people who understand me and know me and support me. And first of all, ask for support, ask for help and do it before the day begins. Send a text message, send a message, say, I really need a little bit of support and love from you. I've also said to myself on those days, okay, who are three more people I can go to that I can get help from? And if they can't help me, will they introduce me to three more people and pick people and, and, and explain your story, show your vulnerability, open yourself up a little bit and say, I'm really feeling low. This happened to me. That vulnerability and that openness will create warmth with someone who knows you well, but then they can share that story to the next person. And that's really going to help. You know, when I've gotten rejected, I just have to go back out and do the exact same thing all over again. And I know that something good will happen. For example, I have written an email often that says, listen, I'd really, I go back into someone, I think, well, I've been slammed. So I'll just get slammed again, but I'm going to keep trying. And all right, I don't know. I'd love to get to know you. I don't know where it's going to go or how we can help each other, but I'd love it if you'd have coffee with me. So even on the lowest days, I'm going to go to someone who's connecting me to, to someone who they think can help me. And I'm going to say that because I think it's opened me up saying, hey, I can't, I'm feeling bad here, but I think we might have something in common. If you do something meaningful for someone else, that gives you courage to keep going rather than sitting in sorrow. <laughs> we don't want anyone sitting in sorrow, but we know there, there are definitely tough days. I do a lot of meditation, a lot. Any um, special apps you use, any techniques? I do. I do. I, I use a lot. So I use Headspace at least mm -hmm. once a day. We actually give it for free to our employees because it is, you know, I don't know if it resonates for people, but it really is a healer of, of tough times. I also belong to a community. It's called Indira Life. And I do my connections every single day on Indira Life. And, um, and then I do monthly sessions that are part of the membership and really teaches me how to get out of my head. And, and into my heart center and into myself, as opposed to, you know, if you think about what the need is picking yourself up from your bootstraps, it is either like fear, depression, anxiety, things like that, which are all in your head. Like if you can get out of your head and into a, a different place, a different aspect of yourself, then the world looks like a different color. And if the world looks like a different color, then you get to go out there and do it again the next day. I exercise, you know, being fit is really important to me, eating a really good meal. So, you know, sometimes when you get depressed, you like want McDonald's and or Shake Shack and or I mean, I'm vegan, but I, I know that's what people do a lot. And, and actually what I do is I go out and I have like my healthiest vegan meal so that my energy is really clean energy. So it's not energy that's bringing me down. It's energy that's actually lifting me up. And I really believe that what you put in your body, I drink a ton of water. I drink 70 ounces at a minimum of water a day. And on the days where I feel down, I drink more water. And so, you know, I, Again, I don't know if this resonates for anyone, but it allows me to work a lot of hours and, and, and be true to myself. Another question that you asked that is really important to answer is balance. And, and I think balance for everyone is very personal because balance for me may not feel like balance to somebody else. And so what I would say is really know what balance means to you and, and seek it. And if you're unable to achieve it, then evaluate your circumstances and understand, is it you that's not giving yourself the balance? Is it your environment that's not giving you the balance? 
or is it social norms, either at work or at home, that's not giving you the balance and evaluate it because very often imbalance happens because we're driving it. It's our own personal issue, not an, not an issue of my boss told me I had to work 18 hours today. I don't see that happening. And I've been in the craziest of situations, but really I feel like I have to work more in order to achieve. Do you really? Like ask yourself that question, do you really have to do that? Reset, reset from within, as opposed to expecting somebody else to reset for you. I mean, I would also just add, I think that there are multiple meditation apps because I do the exact same thing, but I think she's right. This notion of balance, I don't think it exists. I think it's called family and work separation. When I go, and those who know me know that when I go away, on my in, in my inbox, I say, I'm out of the office. And if you want me to read your email, send it when I come back. Yeah. Don't expect me to go through an entire inbox of 25,000 emails. Jacqueline knows me well enough. Sometimes I miss things, but I think she's right. I'm an exercise fiend. So I just don't, I think Amy's right. We have a very different work-life balance. <laughs> we do. You know, and she totally understands and gets gets her own. And she's she thrives on it, and I thrive on mine as well. That but is really, to understand, understand how to make it happen. We learn the hard way, I think, from missing things in our lives and missing children's events. And I've been married more than once, so I've obviously learned a lot along the way. Can I just say a huge thank you to you both, and just like a, a round of applause for how incredible you are, how open, honest, vulnerable you have been with us and our community. This was so beautiful. And ladies, wow, an hour just flew by. I can talk to you both for about three hours, okay? <laughs> One hour is not enough time because there's still so many questions and things that we have. But let me say this to our fabulous community here with us today. We will be sending details on image intelligence and ever body so that you can follow them so that you can find them on LinkedIn, that you can connect with them. And if you do have further questions, we are happy to facilitate an email introduction so you can ask them as well. These are two powerhouses. We are so grateful for your time and your energy and being a part of this community and passing the roadmap to Feely because that is what it's all about. And that's how we can implement change and help female founders rise and succeed by sharing these personal stories of resiliency and friendship and candor and you both are amazing thank oh, you thank, thank you, you so, so much. much yeah and the, we'll do it again anytime absolutely and ladies if any of you are interested in joining us for a cohort mastermind membership please check out our, our websites phillytribe.com and we are launching the first cohort so please join us thank you yeah. thank, thank you, you so much good luck to everybody i send you off with white light and fearlessness i love your energy <laughs> energy I send you off with hope and love and compassion oh thank you ladies this was thank the you. highlight of the week thank you so much we are so grateful for you both and thank wishing you, you a fantastic us. day thank you everyone you for too. joining bye -bye. us thank you everyone thank you.